presentation is not truly a, a dust presentation, but it, it brings some of the ideas about how we can use this type of uh, distributed sensing to be able to solve some other some, uh, different type of problems. So, and the presentation is going to be by Professor Richard Allen. Uh, uh, Richard has a, has a, a, a BA from University of Cambridge, a PhD from Princeton, and he was a postdoctoral fellow at Caltech. After that, he was a faculty member at University of Wisconsin-Madison. I say that because I was a colleague of him for about uh, six months before joining the University of California, Berkeley, where he's now a 1954 professor in the Department of Air and Planetary Science at the University at the, uh, in Berkeley. And he's also the director of the Berkeley Seismology Laboratory. His area of expertise include earthquake alerting system and deep earth imaging. The title of his presentation today is Earthquake Early Warning, a Status and Opportunities for Massive Sensing Network. And hopefully it will help us think about how to expand the use of that system into other exciting research applications. With that, Richard, thank you very much for agreeing to be one of our lecturers today. Great, um, thanks Dante. Um, yes, as Dante said, I was sort of a little surprised when um, the organizing committee asked me to give this talk. I, so let me just say that again, I am not a DAS person. Um, and so, uh, but what I am very interested in is earthquake early warning and I'll obviously explain exactly what that is. Um, and also, of course, I'm very interested in using any kind of data um, that's available to make earthquake early warning systems better. And of course, that's where I think uh, DAS comes in. And then another point that I'll make, I'll probably make it several times, you know, just listening to Lottie's talk, it seems to me that one of the real challenges or opportunities that there would be for uh, DAS sensing networks is how to access cable that's already out there. Um, and so I just suggest that by coupling access to that fiber to a sort of a public safety uh, benefit like earthquake early warning, I think could really help in getting us as a scientific community access to to some of these uh, resources to these cables that of course are owned by a whole variety of, of, of private entities so that's just something to to bear in mind so what i'm going to do is i'm going to talk about earthquake early warning i'm going to give you an overview of the status of earthquake early warning um, and then at the very end i have some thoughts about where i think um, uh, das and other sort of cable observing capabilities really could contribute to improving earthquake early warning um, but then it's up to you guys to tell me what's really possible and what is not. Okay, so uh, I wanna start by just pointing out that there's two stories here when it comes to earthquake early warning. There's the visible story or perhaps the most public story. Um, and that's the story um, about the actual benefits of early warning. Um, and this is a story I sort of, I use this slide to show the milestones um, in earthquake early warning development over the last few years. Um, but essentially what we've been able to do is we've taken opportunities to be public about what we can do well, with seismic networks for earthquake early warning. And each time that we've been able to do this, we've been able to take a big step forward. So in April 2011, right after the Tohokuoki earthquake, um, we organized a summit where we brought together scientists, public and private sector folks, legislators and foundations to talk about early warning. And that is what led to ShakeAlert, which is the US earthquake early warning system that's generating alerts today. Um, following that, we were able to leverage interest at the White House to organize a summit to talk about early warning. Um, and that really propelled the project forward um, and also led to the creation of MyShake, which is a big piece of what I'll talk about today. Today, MyShake is a smartphone based earthquake early warning and detection system. And then that finally led to public early warnings in California, um, which started just over a year ago, back in October of 2019. And as you can see from some of these pictures, again, there was a high profile to this. And, and that's great and that's exciting, but the real value here is that that high profile leads to what we as scientists have always been struggling, and that is to get better observational networks. So that's the other story behind earthquake early warning, is that that high profile aspect leads to the funding for and the deployment of geophysical networks, much better geophysical networks than we had 
before earthquake early warning. At Berkeley, of course, we run um, a seismic and a geodetic network in Northern California, and we've always talked about those networks as being dual use geophysical networks, um, both for science and for hazard reduction. But we can really point to the impact of sort of starting to develop earthquake early warning in the improvement of the stations. It's just an animation that shows the gradual growth of the seismic network across the western US um, thanks to the development of Shake Alert and the funding that that brought. Um, we started off at a little under 600 stations along the west coast as a whole and um, right now we're getting closer actually to about 1200 stations up and down the west coast of the US um, but there's plans for um, almost 1700 um, stations uh, up and down the west coast. So again the point here is that by coupling the sort of societal benefit to the network, to the data, we can, we can expand these networks significantly. And so that's the story that I think can propagate through um, into the, the DAS um, opportunities that we see here. Okay, so let me back up. Um, for those who don't know what earthquake early warning is, um, this is an animation. Um, obviously, it's a cartoon, but it's a real, it runs into the real time. Um, of a large magnitude eight earthquake on the San Andreas Fault. It's starting up at the northern end of the San Andreas Fault in the Mendocino Triple Junction, and it's gonna rupture all the way down past the San Francisco Bay Area. The brown line is the actual fault propagating down the fault. The circles are the P waves and the S waves. The, the yellow circles are P waves radiating out and the red circles are S waves radiating out. And as you can see, it's only right about now that the P waves are really starting to arrive in the densely populated San Francisco Bay Area, um, some significant amount of time after this earthquake started. But of course, the, the really strong shaking won't start until the S waves arrive, and the most damage won't occur until the rupture itself, the thick brown line in this uh, cartoon, works its way all the way down to the San Andreas Fault. And so the point here is that big earthquakes, they take a long time to evolve. And so by using dense um, uh, sensing networks to rapidly detect earthquakes and then monitor their, their growth as they grow um, in space and time, um, we can actually start to provide warning to people um, that can have real benefits to reducing the, the number of injuries and potentially the number of fatalities in large damaging, damaging earthquakes. Um, and so that's the concept um, behind earthquake early warning. And this is something that, that is, is very real. Mexico um, has had an early warning system uh, since 1991. Um, you've probably heard the early warning system provided successful warnings in some of the recent earthquakes. This is a video from the, uh, the 2017 earthquake in Mexico City. So they already have a warning system, which is that siren that you're hearing in the background. So this these people here, they're out in the street because they got the warning from the early warning. So right here is a clear demonstration of the value of early warning by having seconds, tens of seconds warning. People can get themselves out of harm's way, um, assuming that they know, of course, what to do when they when they get the warning. And so, so my shake, and I'll come to my shake in a minute. That's what my shake's goal is. My shake is about using phones to detect earthquakes and then to issue warnings. And so, my shake's goal is to develop earthquake early warning um, around the globe. Okay, so who could use early warning? Oh, sorry, to pull that a little closer to home. Um, if you just look at the damage from past earthquakes in the US, um, these images are from the Loma Prieta earthquake um, and the Northridge earthquake. Um, and in both cases, more than 50% of the injuries were either due to people falling or things falling on people. And so this leads to a very straightforward conclusion that if everybody has a few seconds of warning, if everybody can drop, take cover, hold on, what you should do, whether you get a warning or whether you feel shaking, you should do the same thing, drop cover and hold on um, in the US, then early warning could potentially reduce the number of injuries by more than 50%. And that's a significant reduction in the impact of earthquakes. Of course, people want a number put on that. Well, the cost of injuries in the Northridge earthquake alone, just the injuries, was estimated to be between two and $3 billion. So, so that's where the real value um, of earthquake early warning comes from. 
sort of, you know, again, a few images just to kind of remind people, particularly those of you who are not on the West Coast, um, of the impacts of earthquake. This is what it might look like if you were in a big box store um, in, in an earthquake. This image actually comes from, um, from Christchurch, New Zealand. Uh, here's the Santiago um, airport terminal. This was an airport, a new airport that was built to very high standards and structurally did great, as we expect many buildings to do in the US as well. But the interior fittings, many of them all collapse and fall. So this is why you do drop cover hold on um, in an earthquake. A concert hall um, in Japan that fortunately was not occupied um, during the, uh, the Tohoku uh, earthquake. And then, so that's sort of personal protection, but you can also think of course about many um, automated um, responses here in the Bay Area, for example, the BART train system that uh, many of you would have used when uh, in the good old days when we actually used to come to AGU meetings, um, uh, automatically slows and stops now with the early warning system in the US, but other environments, um, hazardous machinery, chemicals, data security, situational awareness, these are all kind of uses of earthquake early warning. Okay, so that's kind of why earthquake early warning. So what are the elements of an earthquake early warning system? Um, it's not really that complicated. You need a detection network. So you need a, 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 a sensor network distributed across the, uh, the hazardous region to actually detect an earthquake that's underway. You need algorithms, you need a decision maker, I mean an automated decision maker, to, to process that data, recognize earthquakes and decide when to send out an alert. And then you need to be able to send the alert out to broadcast the alert um, to, to people. Um, and so when it comes to the earthquake detection, as I said at the beginning, any source of data, it's gonna provide us with information. There's no reason not to use it. Seismic networks are what ShakeAlert uses today. Smartphones is what MyShake is using today. Of course, you can imagine using the internet of things um, with accelerometers and other kinds of sensors, you can imagine using DAS um, um, observatories um, for the same kinds of reasons, and then pushing out the alerts. The alerts need you to be targeted. They need, you need to know you, uh, where you're sending the alerts. So you have to have the control to limit the area that's receiving the alert. That seems like an obvious thing, but it's actually kind of challenging. And so this is actually what we call the MyShake platform. Um, as I mentioned, MyShake is a smartphone app. I'm gonna show you more about that. Um, but there's no reason why other elements couldn't provide data into the system um, and other alerting uh, pathways couldn't take information out of the system. Um, but MyShake is primarily based on a smartphone app that you can download. And so I'm going to use this to sort of um, to show kind of the status of where we are. Before I go any further, I just want to mention the MyShake team. This is a very hardworking group, a very small group of people um, who have been developing MyShake at UC Berkeley. In particular, I just want to kind of point to Ching Kai Kong. He's now a researcher at the BSL, um, and his PhD um, was largely the development of the capabilities of the, My, of the MyShake network. So I just want to highlight that. Okay, so MyShake is now an app. It's available. You can download it. It's free in the Apple Store or in the Google Play Store. Um, and it does a variety of things. First of all, it delivers earthquake early warning. If you're in California, you will get a warning using the MyShake app. It also provides detailed uh, damage information um, that's reported by users. So if you're in an earthquake, um, and if I'm at work in Berkeley and there's an earthquake, but I live over in San Francisco, um, I'd be able to see is the damage in Berkeley, is the damage in San Francisco. It turns out that this is a really important piece of rapid after earthquake information. Again, this is emphasizing the connection between the observational network, which I'll get to in a minute, which is the phones itself, and providing users with what they need, information after an earthquake. It has safety and preparedness tips. It has earthquake information from, from around the world. I encourage you to download it and explore it as a sort of interesting tool, whether you're in an earthquake prone region um, or not. Um, MyShake was launched, um, well, version 2.0, which includes the public alerting capability, was launched um, a little under a year ago. Um, it, to, to sort of build a network like this, i.e. have lots and lots of people download the app, it has to be high profile. We were very fortunate to have the support of the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, um, who, who launched it for us at this, this press conference. And that really drove the download, which is what makes something like this possible. Okay, so first of all, the alert delivery side of the, of the problem um, using, uh, using the MyShake app. Um, this is what an alert looks like, uh, just to give you a sense. 
Earthquake. Drop cover, hold on. Checking expected. I realize I didn't check. I hope you can hear the sound from, uh, from the computer. Um, but that's what an alert looks like. If you have MyShake on your phone and you're in California, um, you will get alerts. Um, and and that, is what, that is what the alert looks like. Okay, so that brings me to Shake Alert. So Shake Alert is the US earthquake early warning system. Um, the system is operated by the USGS uh, in collaboration with the, the universities up and down the West Coast, UC Berkeley, Caltech, University of Oregon, University of Washington, and also with the state emergency management agencies, Cal OES in California, and the same agencies in Oregon and Washington. So ShakeAlert uses the traditional seismic network up and down the West Coast that I showed you in the second slide um, to detect earthquakes, generate alerts, um, and then these alerts can be delivered to people. So they're used by industrial um, and technical users up and down the West Coast, but they're only available for the public um, in California. Um, and right now, one of the primary ways um, that people actually receive those alerts in California is um, through the MyShake app. So in this case, the alerts are coming from the traditional network, but being pushed out um, to the MyShake app. Um, just to sort of emphasize, earthquake early warning is possible. Earthquake early warning does work. Um, the, the first big test for Shake Alert was the Ridgecrest earthquake sequence last year um, on July 4th and July 5th. Um, it was, you can see the locations, the epicenters, the two red stars on this map, some distance um, from LA. Um, this was not long after the system um, had become public. And so it was sort of the first real test for the system. But at this time, public alerts weren't available. So um, my Shake app was not out delivering alerts at this time. But what I can show you is what the alert looked like on, this is another way of receiving the alerts. This is what's called the user display. It's a desktop um, application that receives the alerts from Shake Alert. And this is what the alert, they had it in the uh, emergency response center in the LA City Hall. And so this is what the alert looks like um, for this Ridgecrest earthquake. <laughs> Ooh. Earthquake. Loud. Earthquake. Weak. Shaking expected in 41 okay, seconds. Okay, so the shake alert detected the um, detected the earthquake. Earthquake. Pushed out the alert. And then this application weak. is actually saying expected in 30 weak seconds. in LA City Hall. And if you saw about 40 seconds of warning. Earthquake. And for this particular earthquake. Earthquake. Weak. Shaking expected in 19 seconds. to make seconds. you listen to the whole thing, but I, I won't do that. Okay, so that's the alert delivery piece. But the other piece, the piece that frankly is most exciting for us in my shake, is the earthquake detection side of the problem and using the phones themselves to also detect earthquakes. So this is now getting into the idea of, of taking this public good, alert, earthquake alerting, and using it to sort of expand our sensing network, in this case, with phones. And so MyShake, when you download the MyShake app, not only do you get the warnings if you're in California, but it also turns your phone into a seismic sensor. Um, and so just to show you, you can play with it. We even added, we're, we are a university after all, so we added some educational components to the app, including the ability um, to, to look at the sensor and actually have, you know, see on the screen what the app is doing. And you can see the vertical component here. Of course, it's acceleration. So when the phone is just still, the vertical component is at minus one G, um, and then the two horizontal components. And this, uh, this um, RCN, of course, is also sponsored by Iris. And so I'll just point out, you can see um, in the, uh, the little screenshot here, there's also included in the app is the ability to explore non-mobile sensors, the, the traditional network that Iris put together and was included in the app. So thank you to Iris for that. Okay, so the idea though is that, so that's kind of for fun, so people can look at it. What's the network actually doing to detect earthquakes? Well, when somebody downloads the app onto their phone, it turns it into a, a mini seismometer. When the phone is stationary and plugged into power, it starts to monitor ground shaking, looking for earthquakes. When it detects earthquakes, it then sends that information to our backend server um, so that we can try and first detect and locate earthquakes. Um, we also then record the seismic data, the waveform data, um, over very, these of course can potentially be very dense arrays, and we can use that for all kinds of research offline. MyShake records five minutes worth of data in total when a phone triggers and detects the earthquake. So we can look at block by block shaking, we can look at the response of buildings, um, thing, things like that. The, the thing that makes this work, of course, is that uh, we're able to separate earthquakes from non-earthquakes. And this is the real kind of 
um, smarts in the system is separating earthquakes from non-earthquakes. This is work done by Ching Kai Kong um, early on in the project. Um, and this is using two second windows of data to separate these two signals with a very high um, degree of success. More than 90 degree success, 90 percent of the time we're successful in separating these two. And of course, once an individual phone thinks it's seeing an earthquake and we send that trigger to our server, we can rapidly confirm that an earthquake is underway um, by combining triggers from many phones all at the same time. Um, and this sold out again, sort of large sensing networks is before the focus in California. Um, and this time we, we had a global network. We literally had the global network rolled out overnight. But of course, you know, if we start thinking about using KDAL, if you can think about getting the right kinds of access. So then to show you kind of the ability to detect earthquakes. This is from the Borrego Springs earthquake in Southern California. All of the greens here are my are phones that were running my shake at the time of this earthquake. Um, and then when an individual phone triggers thinking that it's seeing an earthquake, it turns orange. So that's what you're seeing. The yellow circles are the sort of estimated P and S wave front um, as they propagate out. And what you can see is that most of the phones closest to the epicenter actually do trigger. But as you get out into Los Angeles, and I'll let it play one more time, the P wave gets to Palm Springs. You can see that the P wave is triggering most of the phones in Palm Springs. Um, as we get further out, you see the P wave is triggering fewer and fewer phones. But then the S wave does then trigger more phones, as not surprisingly, is the S wave is going to be larger large amplitude. And you can take this and you can turn this into a detection algorithm as well. So if I now play it, so that was just raw data I was showing you. This is a rerun using our earthquake detection algorithm. Um, and so you can see as soon as a bunch of phones in Palm Springs have detected the earthquake, the algorithm recognizes it's an earthquake, locates it as the star moves around. That's the location estimate, estimated to be a magnitude 5.0. And then that red circle there is the alerting region. Um, and so that's the region where we expect the shaking intensity to be greater than uh, intensity three, sorry, intensity four. Um, so this is just illustrates the capabilities of using a network like this um, for earthquake early warning. Okay, so some successes. Um, Shake Alert um, is now detecting earthquakes and generating alerts in California, Oregon, and Washington. Um, as, as some of my colleagues like to point out, this is sort of the ultimate hypothesis test. Every single day, we test the hypothesis that our, our algorithms, that our models for earthquakes are working by seeing whether we detect and locate earthquakes or not. And it's doing a good job for earthquakes from magnitude four up through magnitude seven. In fact, uh, in, during the first talk today, we sent out an alert for a magnitude, uh, I forget, I think it was five earthquake in the Salton Sea area. Um, was detected and an alert went out to the, the people with the MyShake on their phones uh, in the area around the Salton Sea area. Um, but there are still challenges, in particular for the biggest earthquakes. So recognizing, so, so using algorithms for these smaller earthquakes up to about magnitude seven uh, is very robust. There are algorithms, um, both seismic and geodetic algorithms for larger magnitude earthquakes. Um, but I think there's more that can be done to do a better job for the larger magnitude earthquakes. That requires more data and the ability to, to see what's happening to the earthquake as time proceeds. Um, on the MyShake side of things, we're now delivering shake alert to the public in California. Um, there was a plan to roll out to Oregon and Washington this year that got put on hold by the emergency managers in the state. They've been somewhat busy. Um, but it's also providing this massive new source of seismic data um, from around the globe, which is something, to be honest, we're only just starting to, to dig into. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to sort of start this idea of, of testing alerts um, using MyShake um, in, in the coming months. Um, this is my last slide before I come to the DAS piece. I, I just want to kind of come back to this sort of virtuous circle idea here. I, I think this is really important as we move forward um, with what we're doing in science. Is we're obviously all scientists. We're all interested in scientific discovery. It can lead to hazard reduction. Um, uh, the hazard reduction, if it's uh, going to be effective, often needs user application, uh, which requires sort of or could be used to couple to citizen science, which could lead back to scientific discovery. This is the sort of um, the circle that we're hoping to create with the MyShake project. 
And so sort of to put some more specifics on this, in our case, of course, the hazard reduction is earthquake early warning. Um, this, this is the application. It's going by just having that application, by having people ready to download it, people are more earthquake aware. Um, so that's part of the education and, and preparedness aspect of this. Um, this leads to the societal engagement and the citizen science, the interest in the citizen science, which leads to the data and, and then potentially leads to more science, the block by block shaking, the earthquake rupture physics, um, the applications that I mentioned at the very beginning. And so we hope to continue to build this through the engagement um, with society by providing a public good, we'll also be able to enhance, enhance the science that we're able to do. So that brings me to the DAS piece. Um, so now, so yes, so two slides. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, so where might the DAS um, and other sort of cabled observatories fit in into this? I think there are two areas. Um, the first is in earthquake detection, um, and so as you saw from the map at the beginning, we we have lots of of stations onshore. Of course, I'm talking about the U.S. here, and we have lots of stations onshore. But the biggest earthquakes we have to worry about are actually offshore, the large uh, subduction zone events um, off the Pacific Northwest. And so that's clearly a challenge. Um, I can't resist including uh, this. Many of you may have seen this Google um, blog um, that was posted uh, July 16th, so a little under a month ago, um, where they started talking about using cabled observatories um, to detect earthquakes. This is a little different. This is using state of polarization information. So it doesn't have the location information that Lockie was talking about. But it just, again, this illustrates the interests of other groups, in this case Google, um, in using these kinds of capabilities for societal good. In this case, the blog is specifically talking about detecting earthquakes using the, uh, the Google um, infrastructure. But of course, there's many more cables than this. Um, I just pulled this off the internet um, in terms of, and I focused in on the regions around subduction zones. Um, and so of course the potential uh, of using these in various ways to detect earthquakes would have a huge benefit for earthquake early warning. Um, there's no question about that. And then the other area, this is my last slide, Dante. The other area um, I think, uh, so that's the earthquake detection side of the problem. The other area is in the ground motion prediction part. And one of the real challenges we have is accurately estimating the area that's going to feel an earthquake or is going to be affected, where the damage is going to occur um, in an earthquake. So the way that we currently do that is that um, we alert a region based on a generic ground motion prediction equation. So we have a generic equation, we have an estimated magnitude from the algorithms, um, and then we use the distance just to estimate. So we're basically going out to some radial distance from the epicenter of the earthquake or from the fault when we're estimating the finite extent of the fault. And that's the region that we alert. But we all know that ground motion isn't that simple. It's much more uh, complicated than that. Um, and so I think the question would be, can we use DAS observations, particularly in the urban environment where people are, where people want the warning, um, to provide better ways of, of um, estimating ground shaking, predicting ground shaking. And that could be done in two ways. It could actually be done ahead of time by using these observations to better characterize um, amplification effects in the urban environment. So we're sort of forward, we have models that we use then in real time to decide where we issue the warnings. But it could also be used, of course, in real time to actually uh, both be monitoring how the earthquake progresses, the earthquake detection part, but also the ground shaking and correct for um, uh, for the fact that same magnitude earthquakes can have different levels of, shake, uh, of shaking. Um, so those are just a few ideas of how I think DAS could really contribute um, to earthquake early warning. And as I said at the beginning, I think that by engaging with a project that has this, um, this sort of societal benefit associated with it, it just allows us to leverage more resources, which we then can use for the science as well as for the hazard reduction. All right, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Very much appreciated. Excellent talk. Thank you. A round of applause from, from the team. Thank you. Uh, very good. So we have a few minutes for questions, and uh, I've got a couple of questions related, first off, to, to uh, what you were speaking of early on on, on, the, on the phone system. Are there issues of individual phones delivering seismic data in real time and flooding the communication network from, from Bruce Howe? 
Um, yeah, that's a great question. There isn't. And the way we're doing this is that the waveforms themselves, um, that the five minutes of data, they're actually uploaded after the fact. So that's, uh, that's only available for the research um, that we can do later. So it goes into the archive for research purposes. For the early warning um, application, the real-time aspect, we only upload uh, minimal information. So we, we take the trigger on the phone and we upload obviously things like the time and the location of the trigger and some key parameters about the waveform. And that's what's used in order to detect the earthquake and do the early warning. To be clear, we're not issuing alerts from my shake detections at this point. The only alerts that we're issuing are coming from, um, from shake alert. But that's, that's how we get around that, um, that bandwidth problem that you asked about. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and now thinking a little bit more on, on distributed acoustic sensing, uh, and this comes from, from Nate, Lindsay, and I'll add a little bit to the, I'll, I'll follow the question up with a question I have, but are there potential uh, civil liberty concerns with using DAS information, sensors under your feet and cell phones um, from individuals? So you're both using the cellular network as well as the fiber network for- Yeah, obviously privacy is absolutely paramount. I, you know, I'm an academic. I. I never really realized how sensitive an issue this was until we, we launched MyShake, the first version of MyShake in 2016. I mean, privacy is absolutely paramount and you have to be very careful about how you are using um, uh, this kind of data. In the case of MyShake, for example, there is no, we collect no personal information whatsoever. So when people download the app, um, there's, there's, no, there's no registration, there's no email addresses, there's no names, there's not, none of that information comes at all. Um, when it comes to the locations, all of the location information is, is a course, is course location information for exactly the same reason. So it's about really doing everything you can to, to maximize the privacy. Um, I'm not sure, I don't sure I quite understand the connection with the DAS piece. I mean, of course, when it comes to uh, using DAS data as well, I'm sure that uh, in situations where there's some sort of overlap with personal information, then you would have to be very careful, but it's not immediately obvious to me what that would be, to be honest. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Nate, can you unmute yourself? You also, Nate Lindsay, you asked a question regarding DAS as a long chain single component sensor and, and um, I've copied it, but I'm not quite sure I follow the question 100%. So you can, if you can unmute yourself, I think you can ask the question. Yeah, sure. So my question is, uh, you can hear me, yeah. My question is, you know, DAS is this array. And uh, in Earthquake Early Warning, you described that you can use multiple cell phones and you can kind of use an array of cell phones to make decisions in an Earthquake Early Warning context. So. My question is kind of to get us thinking more about DAS as an array for earthquake early warning. What, what information is available when you're recording that type of a, an array wave field that isn't available for a single cell phone? Yeah, I mean, the, first of all, you know, if you have an array, so first of all, let's think about the location problem. I mean, I, sorry, let me back up. I think the best way to think about this is, is not how DAS type of observations could help with earthquake detection in the US because we have very dense networks. We're very fortunate, as I showed at the beginning, the networks have become very dense. But if you think in other places, I mean, this is why the same thinking behind my shape, if you go to other parts of the world that are earthquake prone, we don't have those kinds of networks. So, so then that's when the phone can be used as an array to, to detect the event. And it's, it's frankly, it's very straightforward kinds of seismology. It's how do you locate earthquakes based on looking at the move out of the seismic arrivals? And of course, a DAS cable can provide that move out for you, um, just as an array of smartphones um, could provide that move out for you as well. But I think that the other piece that we're beginning to understand is a, is a big source of uncertainty in early warning, is the actual amplitudes of ground shaking that people experience. We, we know that ground motion prediction equations have huge uncertainties, a factor of two for those who are not factor of two um, variation in ground shaking at a given location for a given magnitude, even knowing what the site conditions are or standard site corrections, I should say. So, so by actually being able to make observations of the ground shaking closer to the epicenter, we can better characterize the event in order to forward predict what the shaking is going to be. But also, um, sort of Latte mentioned in her talk, the idea of using cables to understand how infrastructure is affected. 
Um, so by using these kinds of observations to see how buildings react to earthquakes, for example, how other types of infrastructure react to earthquakes, I think could provide us with a lot of, uh, a lot of information about future earthquake impacts, which could also factor into the kinds of warnings that we have. Thank you, Richard. Um, uh, Richard, I'm going to follow up on that question. If thinking about using existing telecom fibers that are in, in an urban environment, um, the urban environment does, and to measure ground motion, the urban environment does change because of construction and, and the issues we haven't talked at all in this present, in this, uh, this morning about the issues of, of uh, coupling of the acoustic of the cable itself to the ground and, and so how much ground motion the, ca the uh, fiber would actually see which could be a function of how it's connected to the ground and that may change in an urban environment as construction as as these telecom companies change their fibers um, and how do you see that evolving in the future um, <laughs> That's a tough question. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I, clearly none of us know the answer to that. Uh, I mean, I, th but I would say two things. So first of all, you know, when it comes to detecting earthquakes, the first part of the problem is actually locating the earthquakes. And of course, that sensitivity that you're talking about is mostly about the amplitude side of the signal, right? And so it would not affect the ability to detect earthquakes that are underway. So that's the first part. Um, but then when it comes to estimating the actual magnitude of the earthquake or the estimated ground shaking, that's where the amplitude information does come in. And so those kinds of, of uncertainties essentially in the, um, uh, in the sensitivity of the instrumentation really is going to make a big difference. You know, the, 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 the way that I think we can start to look at this is that we have many smaller magnitude earthquakes. I mean, this is one of the things we've learned with MyShake um, is that we are able to detect much smaller events, magnitude four events, which happen relatively frequently. And so every time there's a, an earthquake, um, it's an opportunity to really understand the sensitivity of the network. And that would be true of using um, the cabled observatories as well. Scott, uh, I'm sorry, we are running out of beyond our time, but I have a short question for Richard. So. Uh, you will have the similar type of problem at different time scale with cell phones. You know, like if you have a cell phone in your pocket, the response will be different than if a cell phone is on the table and or is in the ground. So how do you determine what is noise and what is data for your type of network? Yeah, so first of all, we've done everything we can to minimize that issue by we only go into monitoring mode when the phones are stationary. So if the phone's in your pocket, it's not in monitoring mode. So that's kind of an important piece. But still, there's the issue, right? The, that um, phones are on tables, they're in bags on the floor, um, they're in different kinds of, of environments. And so one of the things we're trying to understand is what's the range of ground shaking that we see as a result. And so, so to a first order, we, what we see is that the, the amplitudes of ground shaking on the phones are a factor of two greater than the amplitude of ground shaking that we see on traditional sensors. That actually really surprised us to start with, but then talking with structural engineers, we came to understand that actually that's the building response right there is the fact that all of the smartphone sensors are in buildings rather than in free field sites like the traditional seismic network is. And then you have to add on to that a layer, which is you know how wobbly is your table um, kind of thing. And so of course, we can't answer that on an individual um, observation by observation uh, kind of way. Instead, we have to do it statistically. Um, and so what we're trying to do is understand what the range of observations look like and then what we can, you know, what information, what useful and interesting information you can extract from that about how the built environment um, is responding to the earthquakes. But actually, one more comment, sorry. There's the other side of this is that a lot, a lot uh, my reaction as a seismologist when we first started thinking about this was, oh, this is terrible. There's all these additional uncertainties. But on the other hand, the phones are actually where the people are. So another way of thinking of this is what we're actually detecting as complicated and as noisy as it may be, is actually what people are experiencing in earthquakes. And so if our goal is to reduce the impact to people, then we just have to be able to deal with that level of complexity. Thank you. Um, and then uh, we'll just close with one comment just from Bruce Howe, which gets back to, to my point of the, that um, basically the, the, the uh, the transfer function capacity or the, how the cables are coupled can, may change. And Bruce suggests that that is perfect for artificial intelligence to handle.
to be able to, to note those changes uh, automatically. So thank you, Bruce. All right, I think uh, we are going to uh, move into, a, a, uh, I'm gonna transfer over to Nate, Lindsay. We're gonna talk about frequently asked questions of DAS. So thank you again, Richard, thank you very much.